Excellent, excellent, excellent. It's going to be a simple day. You all got quiet real quick. Don't you want to sing the last song again? I could do that again. Jesus! (laughs) You didn't get that on film, did you? (laughs) We're going to scare people now. Um, We need to take the offering. So I need young or old, whoever wants to volunteer. I got it. All right. Right in the middle, young and old. Oh, there we go. We got a younger one yet. (laughs) Well, mentally. (laughs) No, Jim. Um, We are doing children's church today. We'll break for that after we do a little talking here and everybody gets settled in. Family feast is fun, isn't it? We got a lot of stuff coming up. We are going to, and I kind of wanted to throw it at you, but I know you're already going to say yes. Uh, we're going to, I think it's the 18th, we're going to try and do our own little Thanksgiving thing here at the church, like a family feast, so we're going to jump the family feast up. Is that okay? That's a, sun, that's a Sunday. It's not like I'm inconvenienced you or anything. Now, I don't want anybody to do the thing where we go out and actually cook massive turkeys. We're just going to do the cheater ones, the ones that they've already cut up. And, but we're going to try and do a little bit of a Thanksgiving thing on the 18th. And I needed to let pertinent people know that. Another thing we're going to do is... And, uh, if, yeah, do it like a Thanksgiving dinner. What do you think? Are you all cool with that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Bucky Hurd asked for this. He asked that, uh, uh, that we do like a Christmas special. Um, after talking about it in the business meeting, we have decided uh, Tim and is going to talk to Bucky about him doing, his, doing a show, his, his Christmas thing. Set it up. So we're putting the burden on Bucky to produce that. But here's something we're going to do, and I think this will be fun. <clears throat> Church is going to go out and get $1,000 worth of gift cards. That'll be $25 a piece. That's about 40 I think, if the math's right on that. And what we want to do is we're going to put it in an envelope, we're going to put a little letter in there, and we're going to invite people to come to the Christmas concert that Bucky's going to do, and you pick whoever you want to give that gift card to, to invite them, and that's our Christmas present to whoever you choose to give that to. I think that'll be fun, right? Yeah. Um, Let me see, what else do I need? I've got notes, and I've got my prescription glasses, which I have to look all the way down here. And I didn't get them adjusted because I don't like them anyway. Um, Let's pray then and dismiss the kids, and then I'll get on to the other stuff here because I have a few announcements I want to do. So let's get started. Lord, thank you so very much for the time. of family, the time of relationship that's positive. Thank you for the fact that your intention is for us to know you, to have a relationship with you, to grow in love with you. Lord, thank you for the fact that this is not about religion. This is about family. Thank you for the food that you provided for us, the fact that we have transportation, The fact that we're here today, that we're healthy, or at least getting healthier, or you're taking care of us, whatever is going on in our worlds, Lord, just thank you so much for the fact that you are absolutely intricately involved. As Tim said earlier, Lord, one of the things I do want to ask is that anything that is demonic, anything that is unholy, anything that is self-serving or selfish or self-focused, Lord, in any of our lives today. I pray, Lord, that you deal with that and you bring us to a point of humility and responsibility in reference to our salvation. Lord, as always, we pray for those in the community that do not know you, who do not have a relationship with you. It is our prayer, Lord, that you let us be a part of their lives, that we can encourage them towards that relationship that you have so graciously given to us. Thank you for our babies. Thank you for the experience. And we ask this according to your name and your will. Amen. That's good. I love it. All right. um, 
what I wanted to do today, we are going to be in the last book of John. I think we've had 18 weeks in John. You finally are going to finish up with John. Yay. Um, we're going to be in chapter 21. It's going to be very simple. Um, but I wanted to say some other things to you along the lines of what's going on in the ministry here. I mentioned the Christmas thing. I mentioned Thanksgiving. We're, we're working on the children's ministry, something that I think I need to explain to everyone here in my training as a church planter um, that you need to be aware of. Whenever you have lost uh, your youth, it's very difficult to get them back. It's really hard to get them back. So don't be discouraged by that. That's normal. We do not have a large youth ministry. We do not have a large children's ministry. That is up to God to repair that. A large part of that comes from our ability as people to invite younger couples to be a part of this. One of the things that we need to get going and that we're working on, and you need to encourage uh, Jen and Evan, and if you don't know them, you need to know them, to really get going on trying to help us put together a uh, family group, a um, home group for, you know, families that are raising kids. Those of us that are older, uh, we tend to forget that one of the most critical things in your life at that stage of the game when you're having your babies come up is community. Uh, Most families want to raise their families with other families that are like-minded. So we need to keep praying about that. We need to keep working on developing that out because as we get older, those of you that are my age and older, we tend to get comfortable and forget that we have a major responsibility in bringing the next generation into what it is to be a family, what it is to be a part of a church, what it is to be in a community. I mean, they they need us. It's brilliant how God has set things up to where you have stages of life and each one of those stages, if they are being who they are, or affecting the stage that's next in line. It's, it's really smart. I don't know how, you know, we need the older people. We need the younger people. We need the middle people. We need, all of that is planned out by God for the purpose of developing out healthy life structures. One of the reasons why you need to be in church, and I've told you this before, I think I have, because I talked to too many people, is that it is absolutely a scientific fact that Who you associate with does affect your thinking. It also affects your physical and mental health. It's just a fact. That's why you are designed to where you have mirroring neurons. Big word, huh? You actually are designed to mirror others. It's an amazing thing. We talked about it before. God brilliantly said, don't you forsake the assembling together of the saints. Why? Because it's scientifically proven that you need to mirror something. And God's saying, go hang out as a family, look at what I say, learn what I say, and mirror each other, grow mentally and physically, spiritually. All of that comes into play. It's amazing. Jesus said to love God with what? All those elements, right? Body, soul, spirit. I mean, it's... I think God was a scientist before we had scientists. So that's why we do this. And and one of the focuses has to be, and again, uh, this isn't the sermon yet. It's kind of a sermon. One of the focuses has to be, and we have to remember it, and my job today is to try and help us remember it. We are here for a purpose, a purpose far greater than your paychecks, far greater than your educations, far greater than your goals and plans. You are here for the purpose of glorifying the name of Christ. Why? Because Jesus needs to be glorified? No. Because that is what you were created to do. That is your natural function in Christ, is to bring all focus to Him. Why? Because He's the head of the family. Him and the Father are there for us. They love us. They want to train and develop us. They want us to know what it is to be in a good relationship like they are. They want us to experience that relationship that they have. That's what this is all about. Jesus already took care of your sin issues. Now it's just a matter of being obedient. Because your family loves you and wants you to experience what it is to live an obedient life. This is not religion. 
This is not me trying to make a temple something of value. It's not about a temple. It's not about religious traditions. It is about a relationship. How many of you caught Rav today? Shame, 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 shame. He did such a great job on the topic that I want to steal his whole message. And I may. But it's, it's what we're about. We have to reach the community. And it is not, and you've heard me say it before, I really and truly, and I know you have a hard time believing this, I don't care if there's only 15 of us till the day I die, or 20 of us. It's irrelevant to me. That's, that's a byproduct. What matters is are we doing the ministry. I mean, I, I think I gave this to you before. I don't care what you think about Trump, but he said this. He made a great statement once, and I loved it. And he's not the only one I've heard it said. He was asked one time, you know, how much money does he have? He got mad and threw his hand back and said, what's that matter? That's how you need to think as Christians. What's it matter? It, it doesn't, it's, it's just a byproduct of something I'm doing, right? So as Christians, what matters to us? How well am I functioning on behalf of the family of Christ? How well am I reflecting the glory of my Father and Jesus? How well am I doing that? I'm trying to move cords so I don't trip because I don't, I don't want you all to have a good laugh. Oh, I know it. I can count on that. So, think in terms of this year starting to wrap up. We actually have had a good year. I think, how long have I been preaching here now? Is it? We tried to figure it out earlier. Six. I just ignore the man at the back. Six months. And look at what we're doing in six months. We're changing attitude. We're changing focus. One of the things we're doing on Wednesday night, and Donna did it, which I think is cool. She went home and did it, and I brought her out in the spotlight so she'd be embarrassed. I asked the group, and this is what we're going to try and do. I want everybody that wants to, to learn how to do what I had to learn how to do in approaching Scripture. And it's, it's what Bernard learned to do. I want to teach and get everybody moving in the direction where you don't need me. You can go find for yourself very clearly what the Scripture is saying and teaching. So if I drop off the face of the planet, you know exactly what to do to question if somebody is teaching the Word of God correctly, to use proper hermeneutics. You know those big words by now, right? To properly approach the text, not just with an opinion, but with the actual evidences that are available through the study of the manuscripts. I want all of us to learn how to do that so we won't move from truth just because some fanatical idea comes around and it sounds spiritual, but it's not. We're going to get good at that. Yes? Sure. Sure. And you can't rely on me. You have to become students yourselves. So Wednesday night, the goal is, and we're starting to practice already, we're practicing studying properly the Scriptures. And I gave him a great one. You guys can do it too. I asked him what Jesus meant when he said to Je- Jesus said to Mary, woman, my time has not yet come. Why did he say woman and not mother? Sounds negative in our culture, but that's your test. You go do your homework, find out why. So today what we're going to do is we're going to wrap up in John 21. It's going to be very simple. I think it's applicable. Um, I would like to take credit for this thought process, but I can't. I, got, I stole it from another pastor. So, and I have no problem admitting that. It is always open source. <laughs> Any preacher that tries to tell you it's all his own stuff is lying. And now you've got another problem. So bring up John 21. Did anybody else have any comments about anything that we're trying to do? Any thoughts that I may have missed? Did I cover enough? Okay. All right, last book of the book of John, starting in 1, John 21. After this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he revealed himself in this way. After this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. Simon Peter Thomas called the twin Nathaniel of Cana, and notice he's naming all the people. There's about seven, I think, there. Is that right? And two others, his disciples were together. Don't miss that part right there, by the way. A lot of people go past that. They were together. 
one of the big issues here is we talk of unity. Go to the next, please. Jesus said to them, children, do you have any... Wait a minute, did we pass? Okay. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, we will go with you. Okay, so let's talk a little bit, and then we'll come back. So just leave it up. The event has occurred. We talked about it a little bit last week. You have Jesus has gone to the cross. He rose from the dead. He's now met with them two other times. Here they are now, and they're standing there talking to each other. And they say, Peter says, "Uh, hey, um, I'm going fishing. And the other guys say, "Uh, well, we'll go with you. Now, you automatically would think a negative there. It's it's probably not. If you think about it, you got to eat. They may have needed money. They're fishermen by trade. So they've just decided, well, I guess we'll go fish. It doesn't say anything else beyond that. It does not say that they're still doubting, even though they may be, because they've doubted pretty much all through John and not really believed fully and completely. They've had faith, they've had belief, but they did not have saving faith. At some point, they did. So... Don't sit here and go off on these guys because you would do the same exact thing probably. One of the things I want you to catch, and we'll move through the rest of it, is that when transition comes in your life, you tend to go back to what you were doing before. You resist a lot of times the change that's occurred, both negative or positive, you have issues. But mainly negative issues affect you. We had... We had lost David recently, and you, by nature, and there's nothing wrong with this, will try and go backwards to what once was. I've moved my parents, and they're both 78 years old, and my mom and I have been in a little spat, a little battle, because I understand what's coming, and she's trying to hang on to her past And I'm trying to get her to let go of some of that and downsize to a reasonable size so they can deal with what's coming. And a lot of times what we do is we avoid the transition. We try to figure out ways to make something that worked before work again. I'm sure that, and I use these guys a lot, I'm sure that blacksmiths tried really hard to figure out how to make blacksmithing what it once was when the automobile came out. But it won't work. Because when a transition happens in your life, as scary as it is, as difficult as it is, you have to move forward into it. You have to accept it. You have to think. You cannot run from it. You have to be a realist about it. You have to learn what you can let go of what you should let go of, and stay on task. Because the problem we have as human beings is we fail to recognize that we really were fearfully and wonderfully made. That God did create you with a plan in mind. That God has intention for you. That He has not forgotten you. That He did not leave you in the crisis just to rot and die in your crisis. He didn't put you in the transition just so you would falter and fail. That isn't what He did. That's Satan. That's all Satan telling you, it's over, it's done, I don't know what I'm going to do, how am I going to think, how am I going to reason, uh-uh. God will sit here, and you'll see Jesus do this with Peter, because usually people skip this part of the scripture and go right to the part where Jesus says to Peter, do you love me, do you love me, do you love me? This is important. It wouldn't be in there if it wasn't. These men are in the middle of a transition, a very serious transition. They started their lives out as fishermen. They were called to be fishers of men. They were shown for three and a half years who Jesus was and what their calling was. They messed up like all of us do. They're no different than us. They messed up. They scattered. They panicked. They locked themselves in a room for a few days, scared that they were going to be crucified, which, by the way, you would also be scared of that, especially if you had seen Roman crucifixion. And you knew that it was an issue. 
So why not turn around and go back to what once was? It's safer, isn't it? It's familiar. Familiar. We will go with you. Notice there is a unity there even in that decision they made. I'm proud of them for that. Even though they may be messing up, they're still staying together. They're a team. They went out, got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that he was Jesus. Go to the next one. I'll explain that in a minute too. Jesus said to them, Children, do you have any fish? They answered him, No. He said to them, Cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. Wait a minute. Donna? (laughs) Tell me again what you saw there. Can you remember, or are you too perplexed now? Did you hear her? They tried it their way, they got nothing. They did it Jesus' way, they got something. And what's amazing is the, back up to the last verse real quick. I left one thing for you out that you need to see. Oh, everybody wants to over-spiritualize. Why did they not recognize Jesus? I told you this last week, I'm going to tell you again. You're not thinking straight. It may be that Jesus doesn't look like he used to look. That's possible. I'll accept that. But really, if you put it in more human terms, you're not thinking clearly. This is, they're still in the middle of a major transition in their lives. They, it's hard to think clearly. You may not recognize, you know, it's like the one woman I watched that one day, and at first I got mad, and then I realized, no, I shouldn't be mad about this. I watched her drive right through a red light. And I got up to her at the next red light, and I noticed that she was so intently focused on something that she didn't even know she did it. That's the kind of stuff that happens. It may be that these guys are still so intently focused. Not only that, they've been working from 2 o'clock into the morning because that's when you went fishing. So they've been out there during the night fishing. They're 100 yards offshore. It's morning. I don't know how bright the day was. So don't take Scripture and all the time over-spiritualize it. I've seen people try to build whole magical ideas off of this one point, arguing that Jesus was miraculously and magically shining or different. doesn't matter. It's not the point. The point of the text is who's on the shore? Jesus. Who came back? For the guys that went back to do what they were once doing. Who's faithful? Come on, guys. Yes. That's the, that's the thing in this text you should be going, oh, not whether or not he's recognizable because of some spiritual phenomena. That's the faithfulness of your Lord there. Go now to the next. So he tells them to cast their net in, right? So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. I like this. Go to the next one. The, <laughs> that disciple whom Jesus loved, who is that? John. Therefore said to Peter, it's the Lord. <laughs> Come on, put the exclamation point on there. It's, not, it's, it's Jesus, man. No, it's it's him. He's on this. Who else could do this? Do you see that? Who else could do this? We've been out here fishing all night long. He shows up, tells us we throw our net in, and here's here's the fish. And I like what it says in here. You'll see it here a little later. I like it all. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment. Now think for a minute. What did they usually wear? Wool. Why would you put wool on and jump in the water? Think about it. (laughs) I mean, that's not logical. I mean, he was already dressed to swim to shore. No, what's he doing? I mean, can you see him? And now keep in mind, this is the same guy that when John and him ran to the tomb, John outran him. Remember? So don't forget that. 
I have a picture of an old guy. Okay. He's trying. Can you see him standing on the shore? And he's just dripping. You know, and Jesus, and I bet you money, Jesus is just looking at him laughing. Okay, you don't see those things? <laughs> so when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work and threw himself into the sea. The other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, but about a hundred yards off. When they got out on the land, they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid upon it and bread. Now, just a fun thought, and Donna and I talked about it earlier. And she caught one part of it, which was great, in her study. Where was Peter standing whenever he betrayed Christ? It was at a coal fire. What's that? A coal fire. And of course, your God has cooked some fish and some bread. There is no other God like this God. You tell me. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish. 153 of them stopped there. There is no spiritual context to the 153. Don't try and figure out what the significance of that number is. Very simple, kids. You ever hang out with fishermen? Do they want to show you the pictures of the fish they caught? Do they not want to talk about the fish they caught? Do they not have them mounted on the walls? You have a fisherman riding, of course he's going to say, yeah. We pulled in 153 of them. Big ones. You see it? Yeah. That, is that not simple? Isn't that great? You're actually, I mean, the, God leads us in it. And, all they, all they, and although there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and so with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. Something I want you to think about, again, and I'll keep throwing this out, leave that up. Three and a half years with them, miracles and signs and wonders, more than have been recorded in the book. John says it twice in the book. We didn't record everything he did. Three times now he's come to them. That should give you comfort because it just shows you how difficult it is for us as human beings to really believe, really obey, and really get to the mission at hand. Ask any pastor out there. One of the biggest struggles in most ministries is getting people to understand now who they are, what they are called to do, and to do it. It is hard. And this gives me comfort because it was hard for Jesus who was the master leader. So if he's having an issue, hey, I'm doing okay. I'm doing okay. This was the third time Jesus had revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. That in itself, you would think, was enough, seeing someone come back from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, can you imagine it? They're all hanging out, having a great time, feeling pretty good, probably feeling like they're full, a little tired from fishing, probably still talking about the fact that they got 153 fish, just kind of chilling out. And then here comes our Lord. Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? The unity's there. See it? More than these guys? Do you love me more than these guys? Come on, that's good. Which, I'm glad the question wasn't posed to me. He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, then feed my lambs. Next. We're not going to go into the deep, complicated, theological explanation of the text there. We can do that on a Wednesday night sometime. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? 
I'd like to have seen his face. He said to him, well, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, then tend my sheep. Then he said to him a third time. Now, you, I want to see the other guys, too. I don't know what they're doing. Or they're probably sitting there going, he's in trouble. He's in trouble. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Now, we've all discussed in the past the Greek words that are used there for love three different times, remember? We've also discussed that he says lamb, uh, sheep, and he talks about his flock. So he, there is a deep theological thing going on there, but there's a very simplistic thing going on there. Peter, your sins are already forgiven. What happened back there when you betrayed me, that's already dealt with. It's not the issue anymore, Peter. Stay with me. Listen to what I'm saying. The sin you committed back there where you betrayed me isn't the issue. That's dealt with. The issue is you're not doing what I called you to do. It's not your sin that's the issue back there. It's that you're not moving in the direction I've put you in to go. Look at the crisis and the circumstances that occurred there. Go do exactly what I have caused to come into play in your life. Go out and now do what I commissioned you to do. I think everybody in this room, me included, because I guess I'm in the room. Yeah, we know, we know the day we made a decision for Christ, if you made a decision for Christ, the day you entered in that relationship, You were given a mission. You cannot deny it. If you've looked at your scriptures, it clearly tells you, you have a reason now. Does it not tell you that you were doulos? That you were a slave? A bond servant? You were bought with a price. You were owned. You are a son. You are family. You were redeemed. You were glorified. You have statement after statement after statement of who you are now. In Christ, as a believer, are your sins forgiven past, present, and future according to the Word of God? Yes. Do you believe that's the big question? Do you live in that forgiveness or do you still try to live like the world? That's the next big question. Do you understand that you were called to something far greater than yourself? And that by responding to that call, you will reap the blessing of being a part of the family of God and enjoying it as a believer if you're not moving into that realm where you are responding to your mission and your calling and your new name in Christ, you will be miserable because you're not being what you were made to be. Think about it. Tell me this is religion. This is not religion. This is about a God who saved and redeemed you To call you brother, do you realize he calls you brother? Remember, we looked at it last week. Literally refers to you as God is your father too. Think of the amazingness of that. That you actually can go to God and talk to God personally now. Where before the Jewish people could not do that. You only had a priest that could do that. All of that's in play right now. You all are children of God. You all have a mission for the family of God. Not your little, selfish little worlds that we build. And I'm guilty. i got a grinder pump at home that's broken. And i got Alan coming to my house to help me fix it. But do you know what a grinder pump is? Let me tell you what a grinder pump does. It takes all the sewage of the house and pumps it up to the street so it can go down to the treatment plant. My grinder pump is broke. Guess who's had to get into the grinder pump? You all want to shake my hand now? I don't know why my grinder pump's broke. I don't like it that it's broke. I had to drop $1,400 to replace it. I don't want to spend $1,400. I can spend, and that's just an easy example, I can sit here and speculate and think I must have done something wrong. God must be mad at me. Had this conversation, Rob? And the truth of the matter is, 
I just hear God going, wait a minute. My plan for you hasn't changed. I still have the same plan for you, the same goal for you. Your grinder pump just broke. Just fix it and move on, you big baby. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> hey, that doesn't mean that when I drove to get the grinder pump, I wasn't complaining. And it doesn't mean that I didn't say to him in the car, I don't think I'm going to tell you I'm grateful today because I'm not. But isn't that normal? Do you love me? Go to the next. I don't know if there is any more. I think we're done. What else I got? Oh, my goodness, I've gone long. Three minutes. No, wait, this clock's wrong. (laughs) Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourselves and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hand and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. That's my mom and dad. I wish they'd read that. Then he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. Notice what's happening now. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them. Now Peter is finding out that he's going to die. So they're walking along, him and Jesus. I don't think he had pockets, but he's walking along. Can you see him doing this? What about John? What are you going to do with him? I mean, if I got to die, he should die too, right? And I love Jesus' response, but um, follow me. Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them, the one who had been reclining at the table close to him and had said, Lord, who is it that is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? And Jesus said to him, if it is my will that he remain until I come, What is that to do with you? You follow me. Stop. Do you see what he just told him? Why are you worried about what I'm doing with anybody else? Why I did it? Why somebody was taken and this person wasn't? Why this person has money and I don't? Why this person has whatever and I don't? Why are you concerned about that, Jesus says? He says, stop it. You just follow me. You make me your focus. Whatever your circumstances is, if your grinder pump breaks, you still follow Jesus. You see that? If a loved one dies, you still follow Jesus. You don't stop. It is the answer. It's the answer. It is not easy though. It is hard. Hard, hard, hard. And it comforts me to know that those guys who had seen all of those miracles, like I said, who experienced multiple amounts of miracles, more than you've read about, struggled to follow. It's hard. But that's why you have churches, real churches. Because each and every one of us is supposed to pay attention to each and every one of us and help them follow Jesus when they're struggling and not be embarrassed about the fact that we're struggling because guess what? It's normal to be afraid. It's normal to struggle. It's normal to doubt. You were never told anything differently. It's one of the saddest things in the world to me how many Christians try to convince other Christians they don't struggle with sin. That they do something that's more righteous than you do. As if that makes them somebody better than you. That is the biggest con game going out there. You need me. I need you. It's that simple. You need each other. It's that simple. We all are going to sin. We all are going to struggle. We're all going to have hurts. We're all going to... And guess what? Just like those guys all got and stayed together and went to the boat to go fishing and Jesus is bringing them back and saying, okay, great, you guys are still family, but you need to go be a family together for the name of Christ and for the kingdom of God. And there is where your life is. There is no other substitute. You all could win the lottery in here, and I promise you, almost with my life, that if you won that lottery, you would all be miserable. Because that is not your life. Your life is following Christ, and the odds are, if I gave you enough money, you'd go the other direction. Tell me I'm wrong. (laughs) Well, it's good. So, there's... So... We're righteous. 
When Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? Jesus said to him, if it is my will that it remains until I come. Do you realize that some of them ran around after hearing this thinking that John was going to live forever? Most people don't know that about the first century. They literally were other Christians in the area running around thinking, hey, Jesus uh, just said John's not going to die. And I, I hear people do that with Scripture all the time. It's comical. They, they make it say something it never really said. So the saying spread abroad, well, there it is, among the brothers that this disciple was not to die, yet Jesus did not say to him that he was not to die. But if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? This is the disciple who is bearing witness about these things. Now, John comes back and he says, look, I'm not making any of this up. I'm telling you. And who has written these things? And we know that his testimony is true. He just told you, I'm not lying. Next. Remember, it's a letter. That's it. Well, that's it. Oh, I wanted to go on, actually. No. <laughs> no, that's, that's good. Oh, look, there is more. <laughs> it's amazing. Now, there are also many other things that Jesus did. Where every one of them to be written, I suppose, that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Now, that is an ending. So. Go ahead. Throw it out. Um, he mentioned who we are in Christ. And so you might not be aware of all of that, but I, it's really cool. Um, a couple weeks ago, I did a talk on prayer. And there were these sheets on who we are in Christ. There are two of them, and they're back there on the back, up there where Alan is. Um, take them home because it has, I mean, it must have like a lot. 50, 60. I'm telling Of who we are, who, who God has made us to be. Put those up on your bathroom wall, kitchen wall, whatever, and look at those things every day because we're not a post fan, we're not a musician, we're not a first. Who we are in Christ, who we are first. Right. No one can take that away from you. No one. Get that from from uh, back there, and I'll, I'll be back there to hand them out. I hope. We're gonna do a song. Anyway, they're back there on top wall. Alan, show them where it is. I got them right here, man. Okay. It's two pages, and behind every statement of who we are, there's a, a scripture which you can go to and just digest it. That's who you are. That's who you are. All right. All right, Pope was inspired by the sermon. Yeah. Thank you, Amen. thank you, Pastor Pope. Jesus. <laughs> All right, let's pray ourselves out. Lord, again, thank you for you. Thank you for this commitment. Lord, remind us to be humble. Remind us to be recipients and not self-glorified. Remind us that the purpose is for your name to be put out and not our own. Lord, thank you for the blessing of this salvation. Thank you for the blessing of forgiveness. Thank you for coming back for us repeatedly. Thank you that someday we will be with you permanently for all eternity, living in this relationship in its purity. Again, thank you for all the signs and the things that you point to for us that uh, remind us. And we ask this according to your will. Amen. Oh, a band.